Chris McCaffrey and that group of people that were around him, including Peter and uh, John Duggan, etc., were architects, if you like, for the idea of a, a, a faculty of medicine at the University of Newcastle. And it was a craving not only for producing Peter Stevens, but a craving for producing the idea of the medical school at the university. So that's a great link. And the other thing is that Trevor Wary produced a poem um, on the demise of RNH, uh, the type of the giants at Newcastle, that was recognising these people who had giant, been giants in, in the story of health in the hunter. And it's a great concept, this idea of the giants. There's people who walked across the stage and who've made great strides in innovation and creativity against all the odds. There's a story that we're learning about in relation to health. But I'm quite sure it's a story to be told in engineering, a story to be told in architecture. Who are the giants of Newcastle? You know, in all these areas that are central to the idea of history and heritage. So now, with that, I also want to introduce another man who is a legend in the history of Newcastle Hill and, and another giant who's walked across the stage and particularly across the stage person at the University of Newcastle. I'm talking about John Hamilton, probably speaking the Emeritus Professor John Hamilton, who has quite a, a long stream of academic qualifications and a record of membership of, of colleges, etc. But I won't go through those. Jo John graduated in 1960. He's worked extensively in medical schools. He's been centrally involved in four innovative schools in McMaster, Canada. Miller in Nigeria, Durham, England, and was Dean of Medicine and Health Sciences in Newcastle, Australia for 14 years, from 1984 to 1997. He was Chair of the Australian Medical Council's Accreditation Committee and of the Australian Quality of Health Care Study. For WHO, he was Chair of the Diarrhea Disease Control Program and Consultant in Medical Education. He is now a Professor Emeritus at Newcastle, as I said, and Chair of the Clinical Years of the Medical Curriculum. He has assisted medical schools in many countries and currently in Nigeria, South Africa and Iran. In 2006, he was appointed an Officer of the Order of the British Empire by Her Majesty the Queen for services to international medical education. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce another giant of Newcastle Health. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, Bernie. I've been called many things, not so far a giant. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Margaret, who met my wife in Hunter Street, and they, she said, oh, John would help with that, and that became a <laughs> fixed thing that I found out about a bit later on. I've not got pictures, but I'm going to tell stories. So I'm going to follow in Betty's excellent uh, tradition. Thank you very much for putting that clear picture. She knows intimately all about that. In 1960, when I qualified in England, yes, the board sister gave out meals and so on, and actually ruled the roost, really. You're a medical student, you didn't mess with the sisters. Also, we had Australians coming for postgraduate training. When I was later at Hammersmith, they brought a great innovation. It was Foster's Lager. <laughs> a wee little post-war guys would drink a pint and a half of lager and sort of fall around, and they just kept going. We learned for hours. And during that time, Dr. Roy Mills visited Hammersmith on his self-generated trek of keeping himself up to date, and he met Warren Campbell, who was his great hero, and I was his houseman. Now, I don't think we were in the same ward at the same time, but when I came here in 84 and was scared to go and greet him in his rooms, that was marvelous, because we hit it off immediately. And I was forever grateful to Roy and to many of the other people who were of the McCaffrey time. Gordon, Carriage, Alan Hewson, Many, many others. John Duggan, he was my boss as a gastroenterologist. So it was a very good feeling that the tradition and the heritage was, was going on. We heard about Chris McCaffrey repeatedly and his insistence on the group studying medical education, 
studying Flexner, who was the giant of medical education about 100 years ago, Roy gave me all his Flexner books, typed immaculately. Only lately did I find that they were the practical exercises for the training of the medical secretaries, which served to be able to reproduce books endlessly. And so, absolutely, there is from uh, Chris McCaffrey, I've heard Evans was showing me a lot of, of stuff. He, he said, look, we must set down the basis for a medical school. And in 1973, when the government commission, universities commission, looked at what was necessary for the future of healthcare in terms of medical education and so on, the message was clear, very clear. Medical education was all right in Australia, but every school was exactly the same. Nothing much was done outside teaching hospitals, not much in community, nothing in general practice. Students didn't see them. Social factors in health and illness ignored. Student selection just on the marks. And it was stated that in 1973 that unless a new medical school was set up with the distinct mandate of making forward progress, trying new things in learning and selection in, in diversity of experience, things wouldn't move. What was the most important thing that got the medical school for Newcastle? With all respect to my university, it wasn't the university submissions that they did their stuff. It was the submissions written by the McCaffrey sons and daughters. The submissions of the clinicians of that time, all of which I've got, were the key thing that gave Newcastle the medical school. And so I went to see the head of that commission many years later and confirmed all that. So that's how the medical school came to Newcastle. The first one outside a capital city, extraordinary situation. The Royal Newcastle, together with the Mater, another hospital seen as being a, a proper base for a medical school. And so it came, and so David Madison joined, of course I inherited later after sadly he died, I inherited his shoes, which by then had grown to eight feet long. And the heritage of the memory of David Madison hovered around, which was intimidating, but people were very good. And I remember going down the first, going down the corridor of the John Hunter with Owen James, except that what it actually was, was a leafy little path through the trees along the ridge. Nothing happened yet. It was just starting to be came. Now, all of those clinicians, no matter what some of them may have thought about a university and all that sort of thing, were very welcoming and supportive. So that commitment to medical education and to training was carrying through. And I'll tell you now that the graduates of our medical school are welcomed around Australia. I was talking to the ex-dean of Wollongong early this afternoon, New School. Thank God, she said, for Newcastle graduates in general practice in our area, because they turn to teaching and, and respond and are absolutely wonderful for the students. So that heritage back from McCaffrey is still flowing on in the students coming up. Now, once the John Hunter no controversial and all the rest of it, was coming up. We had to determine how would leadership be developed. Because new programs were going to come. There won't be, there won't be time, perhaps, to come to all of these new research-led initiatives for postgraduate training, for improved services. And Owen James and I discussed this, and with the university's backing, we established a unique system of conjoint appointments in which the university and the health service would together advertise in a single advertisement with criteria worthy of prof professorship and worthy of clinical lead to seek leaders to head up the new initiatives in particular. The first ones were in cardiology, pathology, um, <coughs> branch of reproductive medicine and obstetrics, um, 
neuroscience, uh, genetics, clinical genetics, laboratory genetics. Now that was a unique system to bring the, the forces of academe and service together. Of course, these two systems always rub some people the wrong way. But it brought in a group from overseas and from other parts that very attracted by this new knitting together. And this was the only medical school, I think, in which the dean, myself, chaired every appointments committee for the area health service for a period of about two and a half years. That was tolerated by my clinical colleagues because I think it was done fairly and openly. So that was a unique conjunction of university, just one example of that. Now then we went on and some of what we've heard about reminds us of some of the unique things that were done, not following, not early adopting, but actually initiating. Just before I came, Rob Sanson Fisher, who had worked in the West in Aboriginal things, and Jeffrey Kellerman pushed the notion of starting an initiative to bring indigenous Aboriginal students in to the school. The national program funded for that purpose, and we have trained about half the indigenous doctors in this country have been trained here. Not just that, this tie, or its predecessor, because it, it ran out of uh, color, uh, was given to me at the first big conference of Aboriginal students and academics to look for the, at the future of medical education for Aboriginal students here, right here, headed by our then Aboriginal Director of, of uh, Student Studies and so on. And we brought people from America and Canada, indigenous medics, doctors, and students. The rest of us got out and that this two-day conference devised profile of curriculum, a profile of student support systems, a profile of international links, and the essence of what was then founded with our first graduate, Lewis Peachy, as the president, the Australian Indigenous Doctors Association, AIDA, which now has given a political altitude to the interests of the group, and a few years back, 20 years after the beginning, everybody got together here and had a wonderful reunion. We had two professors of indigenous health. We had several people who were in government taking leads. We have lots of senior lecturers in the different medical schools, especially in the north, where the, these initiatives are now being picked up. And government and the medical council together at that meeting confirmed agreement with government and the deans that the model of Newcastle's management and curriculum for all of this would be the national model, and so it has been, and so it has been copied elsewhere. Restlessness is breaking out on my left, ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> His smile will turn to a ghastly grin in a minute, don't worry. Um, so that, that was a great um, thing, and then with the leadership had to come research. You, if you do not have a strong research base in an emerging medical school, you stutter and stumble. One of the strong areas was foreshadowed by the McCaffrey interest in quality of care and ways of auditing and assessing. Jack Smythe nearly lost his head with the College of Surgeons when he published a study showing that four, you know, three fifths of the appendices taken out were completely normal. He was branded a communist. <laughs> Other people did similar things. So we developed, many of you know Stephen Lieber, he led the academic developments to be able to look at populations of patients and populations at risk, outcomes of health service, health outcomes of treatment, evidence-based medicine rather than just clinical experience. And that went on, and then I was asked, or at least we won the bid, to chair the Quality of Australian Healthcare Study, which now took this sort of approach in much greater depth. And out of that came the whole system of safety of care, governance of health services, to audit and monitor quality of care, and adjust 
treatments, adjust protocols, and the like. And we've now embedded that in our curriculum. The renewal of the curriculum has been ongoing. We've embedded it with our final year students doing those studies of, of problems in healthcare quality or safety of care. Quality of education became a matter of great concern nationally, not because it was wrong, but because the Brits announced that they would no longer credit overseas medical schools. They used to visit the front end of 747s, enjoy the wine, and look at the Australian medical schools, and accredit them, but not for Australian purpose, for Britain, so that they could bring the Foster's ale in and <laughs> make the little fellows drunk. So um, I was asked to take on the task of setting that up. And that was really a reflection of the fact that Newcastle, I think, was seen as was, was thinking out of the box and dynamic. All of this led greatly in the first instance to David Madison, <coughs> who I interestingly met in the first month of his appointment when he visited us in McMaster University, where I've been heading the curriculum. We sat and we had dinner together and talked the curriculum. Spookily, three years ago, I went back and the then head of curriculum took me to lunch and we sat at the same table. Amazing. So, finally, just to, finally, to finish with the research, uh, yesterday I had a lifelong chat to the new director of the Hunter Medical Research Institute. Mari Gleason has led it, John Rostas elegantly before. He's been attracted from Sweden because of this unique structure that is, has been no other structure like this until this was set up. It is not a big block building with a director who has all power, nothing to do with university. That's how most of the other medical schools have set up their institutes. This is an umbrella network, umbrella over a network with researchers in the university, the health service, and so on. And the different programs, I'll just flag one that you'll be reading a lot about, the stroke program, which is in national, international level studies are defining the best approach to stroke, but not just at acute management, now rehabilitation. Our new director is very interested in rehabilitation, the role of health professional care, the role of arts, music, humanities, so the programs now, uh, genetics for instance, the, the coming of the understanding of the human genome has now come right through the infrastructure of science and is now right in the actual discussion of case management in the early morning reports in grad grounds. So we have to keep ourselves up to date through active research. And the Research Center in Genetics, clinical arm, research arm is looking at genetics cancer, genetics of neurological disease, and so on and so on. This attracts trainees in from all sorts of places to get the benefit of that. He's going to stand up, so let's talk. There are other things to say, but there it is. The, the faculty now has a robust set of other health professional programs, each with their own professional direction of pride, but we actually had a conference, consultation, just love, two weeks ago, thinking how the curriculum for the future should be refashioned. With 30 years, it's really perhaps gone time that we should rethink for the modern time. Even Flexter said his recommendations should only last at most 20 or 30 years. So uh, we are as well placed as any university to knit health professional training together. Now, you can't just put everything together into the Lamange. It's got to retain the professional identity and the professional role. Now, I took a lot of the lessons from here when we went to Durham and had looked after one particular part of the curriculum in which we brought patients. If we were doing embryology, we'd have a boy teenager with spina bifida in a wheelchair and he'd talk about his life. His mother would talk about her decisions about whether termination or not. The physiotherapist he worked with would present the whole problem. 
and his educational support person would talk about how the minor brain damage interfered with his learning. And he would talk about this himself. It then, it then focused your attention onto his situation, not only the, the science, not only the embryology, not even only the health professional group, what's called patient-centered. So that flows on from the problem-based learning that we developed here. This curriculum has led to changes in just about every medical school. Some low stock and barrel took our curriculum in Sydney, Flinders, Queensland. And we used to go and, and run tutorials and show them and show them. Gave it all away in a sense. Nowadays we could charge them an arm or leg. We wouldn't actually, because we were set up to show new directions for medical education. So the models and the model for the research structure has been picked up by government, by other countries. Indeed, Gothenburg University, from which our new director is coming, has used this structure in their own background. It's lovely to hear a professor of medicine <coughs> talking about charging an arm on the leg. <laughs> um, I also would just like to draw your attention to John mentioned uh, Michael Nielsen at the new uh, HMRI. He's also a professor of medical science. And that chair is called the Bill and Iris Burgess Chair in Medical Science, set up in honour of Bill and Iris Burgess, who you may remember, I'm sure John will remember the name, as the town clerk, his name was all around his place. His two sons, Stephen and Bill Burgess, were the ones who donated approximately two and a half to three million for that chair. So that's a wonderful piece of heritage. See how it links in with what John's talking about. So indeed that institutes the has been built on a lot of local and public contribution. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful <coughs> connection.